Well, have you ever gotten a letter that contained really, really good news? In that scene from uh, Back to the Future Part 2, uh, Marty McFly receives a letter from like 100 years ago informing him that his good friend and mentor, Doc Brown, is alive and well in the past. And it fills him with joy and relief. Have you ever gotten a letter like that? I've gotten a handful of good news letters. I still remember the letter, the college acceptance letter I got uh, while I was in high school. I remember the letter I got from Tony Gwynn, baseball great Tony Gwynn, uh, who said that he was happy to sign my baseball card and it was enclosed. Uh, I remember uh, a letter I got from one of my celebrity pastor idol crushes who said that uh, he'd gotten my request for a meeting and he would be happy to sit down with me. If you've ever gotten a, a good news letter, letters with really good news, those are certainly uh, better than the other types of letters we receive, letters with really bad news. We remember those letters. We might even remember those letters more than we remember letters with good news. I do. I still remember also the rejection letter I got from my top college choice. I remember uh, letters I got from other baseball organizations saying their baseball players were too busy to sign my baseball cards. Uh, I remember another letter from another celebrity pastor idol crush of mine uh, who, said, who said that he, sorry, he was just too busy to meet with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is good because I was too busy to meet with him too, so it just worked out. In the old days, before text, before email, uh, this is how we shared news, good and bad. We'd send and receive letters. Sometimes, in fact, we'd know a letter would be coming, but we actually wouldn't know what kind of news it would contain, good or bad. All we could do is wait till the letter arrived, and then when it did, nervously open it up and like read it to see if it was going to be a good day or a bad day. The New Testament, uh, for the most part, is a collection of letters. Uh, letters sent by God to us. They're letters that come to us from much earlier than 70 years in the past, but they are letters that contain news even more exciting than getting into college or getting your baseball card signed. They contain unbelievably good news about the love of God, about the forgiveness of our sins, and about, oh yeah, our resurrection from the dead. That's good news. The book of Romans is one such letter. Now, this morning we are starting a new series, as Jeremy said, on the book of Romans. The series is called Not Ashamed. Uh, Romans is a letter written by the author of much of the New Testament portion of the Bible, a guy by the name of Paul. Now, before we jump too far in the series, let me tell you about this guy named Paul. Paul was a, a, uh, an impressive force in the history of early Christianity. Paul was an early convert to Christianity. He was actually an early persecutor of the church. He was a Jewish persecutor of the church until he says he encountered the risen Jesus in a vision uh, on the road to Damascus. And not only did Jesus command him to change his ways, uh, but Jesus commissioned him to spend the rest of his life traveling around the Mediterranean uh, telling people about him. Thereafter, Paul traveled throughout the region preaching to both Jews, his people, and Gentiles, or non-Jews, preaching to them that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus had died for our sins, but that Jesus had been raised from the dead, and that Jesus was coming again. Paul visited dozens, if not hundreds, of cities where he made converts, where he, where he discipled believers, he helped them grow, and, and where he established churches. Now, for the most part, early on in Paul's missionary activity, he actually stayed mostly close to his homeland of Palestine, uh, mostly in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. He's kind of traveled around there. Uh, but eventually, Paul got ambitious, because he understood that Jesus had actually told the disciples to take the gospel where? To the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus told the disciples, and presumably Paul take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And Paul figured, well, someone's actually going to have to do that. So I might as well take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, in, in the first century world, at least in Paul's mind, the ends of the earth was a place called Spain. That was the ends of the earth back then. That's as far as their telescopes could see. That's Spain. Beyond that... Here be dragons. I mean, they had no idea it was beyond the ocean, beyond Spain. So I said, well, that's the end of the earth. I'm going to Spain. But he knew that he couldn't just, like, get on a boat and go to Spain. He had to go, like, halfway first. You know, he needed, like, a base camp to reach out to the rest of the Mediterranean. So he figured Rome 
it would be a pretty good place to operate out of. And Paul had never, as far as we know, been to Rome. And Rome was no, you know, small accomplishment either. Rome needed the gospel to be preached there too. Now, there was a church in Rome, uh, was a small little fledgling church, but it actually wasn't the healthiest church. Uh, the church in Rome, the small little fledgling church in Rome, actually had some... some some, uh, well, it was made up of two types of people. It was made up of Jewish Christians, and then it was made up of non-Jewish Gentile Christians. And if you can believe this, they were having trouble getting along. So Paul planned a visit to Rome to help them deal with this conflict and help establish the church there for future missionary activity. But Paul wanted to introduce himself first. He didn't want to just show up uh, on the doorstep of the church in Rome, say, hi, I'm Paul, I'm here to help he wanted to introduce himself, tell them he was coming, and give them a little bit of a, an idea of what he was going to do. So he writes them this letter. He writes them this letter in which he a 16-chaptered letter in which he uh, introduces himself, uh, explains to them the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, as that which he believes and that which he was going to preach to them. He explains to them the good news of of the gospel. That's what the word gospel means, in fact. The Greek word gospel means good news. So Romans is a good news letter. As Paul writes in chapter 1 of Romans, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. So that's why Paul writes Romans. It's a letter of theological introduction to a struggling church in a big city that he planned to visit on his way through to the ends of the earth. That's why Paul wrote Romans. Now, why are we studying it? And why are we taking so long to study it? I mean, a year? Don't we have other things we want to get to? Well, the reason we're taking so long to study it is because this is 16 chapters of very dense theology. I mean, you really don't want to rush that. In fact, we could, we'll probably run out of time. We could take three years to study Romans and not get to everything in it. This might be the only time in the history of our church that we study Romans, and we, and we want to really study Romans. So that's why we're taking our time with it. But as far as why we're studying Romans in general, the book of Romans stands apart from the rest of the letters in the New Testament. Other letters in the Bible, they get more focused in on the particular situations that are going on in those churches to which they were written, like in Galatians and Corinthians. The letters are all about the problems going on in those churches and what the authors can do to help. Now, that's true in Romans. Like I said, there was a situation going on in the church in Rome that Paul wanted to write to to address. But the book of Romans is less context-specific than the other letters in the New Testament. It includes a much more general presentation of the gospel. And it is a thorough and brilliant presentation as well. The letter makes the legal and the spiritual case for the gospel of Christ in detailed fashion. In fact, the letter of Romans has impacted some of the most brilliant theologians and thinkers in the history of the world. Uh, Martin Luther, the great German reformer, whose birthday we are celebrating this year, by the fact. I don't know if you were able to make the Martin Luther birthday party. Uh, Martin Luther, he said this in the book of Romans. He was born 500 years ago, by the way. Uh, Romans is worthy, Romans is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word, by heart, but occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. It can never be read or pondered too much, and the more it is dealt with, the more precious it becomes, the more it is dealt with, the better it tastes. Other theologians would say the same. Augustine, Calvin, Wesley, Bart, they were all gobsmacked by Romans. The book is both simple and complex, challenging and inspiring poetry and prose. Even I've been seriously impacted by the book. The book of Romans was like the first book in the Bible that I really studied. 
I mean, I'd read the Bible for most of my life, but I never really studied the Bible. And I can still remember, you know, being 18 years old at college with Romans open and with John Stott's commentary, Romans open, uh, just trying to use my callow, uh, immature teenage brain to figure out what exactly was going on in this letter. So that's why we're studying Romans. But enough with very long-winded introductions. Let's just go ahead, rip open the envelope, and dive into this good news letter. Let me read to you the first section of the book, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among the Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is a simple introduction to an ancient letter. This is an introduction to Paul's letter. Paul introduces himself as a servant of Christ and a messenger of the gospel. But if you, if you notice, Paul just doesn't introduce himself, right? This isn't just a simple introduction. It's not like, hi, I'm Paul, you know, hello. Paul doesn't just introduce himself. He announces himself. I mean, he announces himself. This is a grand epistolary entrance. He announces himself as though you're being introduced at a royal British ball. He, he, he smacks open the doors of the saloon. Like the sheriff of Tombstone. That's right. I'm here. I'm Paul. I'm an apostle. I'm a messenger of the gospel. And let me tell you about this gospel. And he goes on to summarize the gospel as the content of which is based on Jesus, the son of David, who is also the son of God, as evidenced by his resurrection from the dead. Through him we receive the grace of God. That's who I am, he says. I am Paul, servant, apostle, gospel preacher. That's who I am. You are the people of Rome. Grace and peace to you. This isn't just a hello. This is a statement. And already in this Introduction. Paul gives us plenty of things to think about. It's said that every word in the Bible is given by God to us for our good. Every word in the Bible is given to us by God for our good. Every chapter, every introduction, every letter introduction has plenty for us to think about and to change our lives. And that's true here. But what's this introduction really about? What's the big idea here in Paul's greeting? Well, I want to share a little uh, Bible study secret with you that uh, we preachers actually like to keep to ourselves to make ourselves look smart. Uh, when we're trying to figure out what a passage in the Bible is all about, uh, here's a secret. Tally the words. Count the words. If you listen to anybody talk, the word count of their vocabulary oftentimes reveals uh, their most important thoughts and ideas. I mean, if you counted the, my children, the words in my children's vocabulary, you would have a very good idea of what they spend their time thinking about. My oldest son, politics, all the time, all day. That's what he talks about. Count the words. Politics, 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 politics. My middle kid, sports, all the time, all day. It's like ESPN, 24-7, all the time. Sports, 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 sports. My, my little girl, ponies. Count the words. <laughs> ponies, all day, all the time. 
And that's true here too. Count the words. Paul uses the word gospel twice. He uses the word God four times. This is a letter about God. If it's a letter about anything, it's a letter about God. He uses the word Christ three times, the word holy three times. But aside from the word God, the most common word in the passage is an interesting one. The word is called. He uses the word called four times. He is called to be an apostle, Paul is. He comes to call the Gentiles to faith and obedience. We are called uh, to belong to Jesus. We are called to holy lives. Uh, Interestingly, this idea of calling is actually very, very important uh, to Paul. He uses that word a lot throughout all of his letters. And he uses the word a lot even in the book of Romans. We're going to run into this word again and again and again. Like in chapter 8 when he says, uh, those that God predestined, he also called. And in chapter 11 when he says, the Lord's gifts and the Lord's calling are irrevocable. Now, this idea of calling is one rich in meaning and history. Paul borrows it uh, from authors in the New Testament who describe the way God calls, calls Israel out of the slavery of Egypt. And even Jesus uses this word, too, to describe what he does when he sees fishermen and he calls them to become his disciples. Uh, The word calling, our English word calling, translates a Greek word in the New Testament. New Testament was written in Greek, and the Greek word here is kletos. That's the Greek word which we translate into calling. And a kletos is a very important word. It it, it means to summons or to invite strongly. A a calling, a kletos, it's it's not like, you know, a telephone call where we pick up the phone to to kind of call our friends and chat and and catch up and find out how they're doing. That's not a biblical call. That's not a kletos. A a, a kletos is is like when you stick your head out the back door and yell out into the backyard, Fido, come home! And your dog comes running, that's a call, come. Or, Or a kletos, a biblical call is when I show up at my neighbor's doorstep, like I did a, a few days ago, my neighbor Valerie's doorstep, and I knock on the door, and, and I say, Hi, Valerie, how are you? Sorry, actually not here at cha- ta- ta- to talk. I'm here to call my daughter home. Send my daughter home. She needs to come home. That's a kletos. That's a calling. It's a beckoning, a summoning. To call means to summon, to beckon, to compel. And that's what Paul is doing here. He is summoning us forth. As he has been called as an apostle, he is summoning us, calling us to faith. Now, this is important, and it is meaningful. Why? Because we all need a call. We were made to function best. We were made to live most happily when answering God's call. Without a call, we might be busy with our lives. We might even be relatively happy, but ultimately aimless and confused with our lives. Each of us need a calling from God to straighten our lives out and to give us some sense of transcendent divine purpose. Uh, for example, one of my uh, favorite sports movies is this total cheese ball baseball movie. It's called The Rookie with Dennis Quaid. Anybody seen The Rookie with Dennis Quaid? Total cheese ball movie. Don't judge me by my preference for cheese ball movies. I'm really quite sophisticated. I just happen to, you know, like really sophisticated or uh, cheese ball sports movies. But in the in the movie, uh, Dennis Quaid is an aging uh, high school teacher who had dreams of playing professional baseball, but they sort of, you know, as these things do, went by the wayside, and he just kind of fell into a teaching career. But late into his 30s, he actually decides to give his dream of playing baseball another shot. So after a successful tryout, he drops everything to go pitch in the minors. For the better part of a season, he slaves away, pitching in meaningless baseball games. He bounces around in the team bus, going from one small town to another. He can't make enough money to support his family. Uh, The bills start to pile up. His his wife pretends that everything's all right, but it's really not, as she can't provide for the kids and take care of the kids, and she's working too. He's frustrated. He's lonely. He's wondering what he's doing with his life. But then what happens? Gets the call. Gets the call up. 
They ship him to the Rays to pitch out of their bullpen against the Texas Rangers. Suddenly, everything makes sense. Suddenly, he remembers that his life has a purpose. His life has a destination. It's actually one of the more redeeming aspects of what has been a truly, miserably mediocre Cardinal season. <laughs> Watching all these call-ups happen. Uh, Paul DeYoung, Carson Kelly, Luke Weaver, Jack Flaherty, Tommy Pham, Jose Martinez, Luke Voigt. These guys have been waiting, suffering, struggling down in the minors, but then they get the call. And a lot of them, when they, they get the call, then they start playing beyond what they've ever been able to play. Tommy Pham was never this good in the minors, but he got the call. And it gave him purpose and vision for his life. Now they're playing in the show. Makes it worth it. That's what the call of God can do. It gives us purpose and meaning and makes it worth it. You see, at some level, we're all playing in the minors. We're all slave in a way, trying to scratch out a living, wondering what we're doing with our lives and if anything really matters. Yeah, we have families. Yeah, we have jobs. Yeah, we're going to school. But really, does anything matter? We wonder in those unguarded moments. What does it matter that you're busting your butt, raising kids, going to school, and working tirelessly at your job? What does it matter? We all need some sense of divine purpose with our lives. We need to be called by God to do something with our lives. We need the phone to ring. And in Jesus Christ, it rings. It rings for all of us. We all need that call from God. Now, that's nice, Pastor Matt, and I like your baseball analogy, I'm sure you're thinking, right? But what are we talking about exactly? What's this calling business about, really? Well, the early American Puritans, you know the Puritans, the pilgrims, Indians, hats, turkey, uh, the early American Puritans uh, actually thought about calling a lot, and they wrote about calling a lot. And they maintained a very helpful distinction between two types of calling. They would distinguish between general callings and particular callings. A, a particular calling is the summons of God to serve him in some specific way, uh, through an occupation or a profession or, or a, some sort of task. I mean, Paul himself, the Apostle Paul, had a particular calling, and it was to serve God as an apostle or as a messenger of the gospel, specifically to the Gentiles, in fact. He received that calling in a vision, and he even mentions it here in his introduction to the Romans. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ, called to... Be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Not many of us are particularly called to be an apostle. We're called to serve him in other particular ways, as, as musicians or, or as leaders or, or as mothers or writers or deacons or, or um, missionaries uh, to Reynosa and around the world. That's particular calling. God has as many particular callings as he has created particular people. And you got to find your particular calling. But in addition to particular calling, God also gives a general calling, which is maybe even more important than a particular calling. A lot of us get kind of caught up in figuring out what our particular calling is, but we ignore the far more important general calling that God gives everybody, the general calling to obey and follow Jesus with our lives. Our particular calling is how we're going to our particular calling has to do with our, our occupation, but our general calling has to do with our, our salvation. Our particular calling has to do with how we spend our time here on earth. Our, our general calling has to do with how we're going to spend our time, you know, eternally. That's the calling Paul issues here in this passage. Here, Paul uses his particular calling to send forth God's general calling to all his readers, including us. What are we called to? Paul tells us, first, we are called to the obedience that comes through faith. We are called to the obedience that comes through faith. We are called to believe, to have faith in the gospel of Jesus, and we are called to obey God's commands. Obedience and faith are two very important words and concepts that we are going to return to again and again and again in Romans. God calls us to both believe and obey. Christianity is a matter of belief and obedience. You can't say you believe in Jesus. You can't say you love your neighbor without 
serving God and serving your neighbor. God calls us to both. But not only are we called generally to both faith and obedience, I like what Paul says next in verse 6. He says that we who also are among the Gentiles are called to belong to Jesus Christ. We're called to believe, we're called to obey, and we're called to belong. If I had more time, I would develop this into a brilliant, alliterated three-point sermon. (laughs) Believe, obey, belong. It's like just teed up for me right there. And I really like that last calling. We're called to belong. We're called to belong to Jesus. We're called to be his. And by extension, we're called to belong to his church, to his people. And this is good news for us, too. Why? So many of us, if we're honest, don't feel like we really belong anywhere. Uh, We're too old. We're too young. uh, We're too liberal. We're too conservative. Uh, we're too single, we're too married, we're too parenty, uh, we're too funny looking, uh, we're too white collar, we're too blue collar, we're too educated, we're too non educated, uh, we're too black, we're too white, we're too Latino, we're too gay, we're too straight. I mean, who of us really feels like we belong anywhere anymore? I talk to uh, lots of you, even, who don't even feel like you belong in church, which is one place where you should feel a sense of belonging. But I talked to a lot of you who don't even feel like you belong in church. Not even this one. You're too old, you're too young, you're, you've got too many questions, you're too this, you're too that. And in fact, for the record, sometimes I don't even feel like I belong in church. Sometimes I don't even feel like I belong in this church. And I started it. I'm too quirky, uh, I've got too many questions, uh, I've got too many unpredictable politics and theological opinions. I'm not even sure, you know, I fit here all the time. So I can only imagine how you feel. But that might be a, a, a character thing for me, too. I mean, I generally don't feel like I belong anywhere. I uh, don't feel like I belong, you know, in, in whatever city I'm living in. don't feel like I belong in America, although does anybody really feel like they belong in America anymore? <laughs> Left or right? Does anybody feel like, like this is their country anymore? We all feel like we don't belong anywhere, but that's what's compelling about the gospel of Christ. In the gospel, we're called to belong to Jesus, not to belong to a political party, not to belong to a national identity, not to belong to an identity group, but to Jesus. Regardless who we, who we are, our faith makes us his. Regardless of our quirks or colors or politics, we're called to belong to him as a member of his body, his church, in Christ. No one has more right to belong to him than anybody else does. One more time. In Christ, nobody has more right to belong to him than anybody else does. Period. That's what we're called to in Jesus Christ. We're called, summoned to believe, obey, and belong. The call of God is what gives our lives purpose and order. It raises us above the bumbling, aimless mediocrity of our minor league lives. And there's power in the call of God, too. There's strength in God's voice when it goes out. When we truly allow ourselves to hear the call of God, it compels us in a way that other voices may not. As we hear the call of God in in scripture or in prayer or in conversation or or, or in beauty or in a vision, as we hear the call of God in those things, we are compelled to respond to him. When when my daughter uh, hears my voice, especially my firm adult voice, when my daughter hears my firm adult voice, she almost always obeys. She draws the strength to obey in the strength of my voice. When Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and saw those those minor league fishermen sitting on a log, tending their nets, what did he tell them? Come, follow me. That's it. That's what he told them. Come follow me. What do they do? They dropped everything and they followed him. Why? Something about the call. They derived 
strength from the strength of his call. He understood this is not some random guy walking by. There's something about the call. When he speaks to us and calls us to belief, obedience, and belonging, our hearts want to respond like obedient dogs to their masters, like daughters to their, to their fathers, like players to their coach. We know that voice. We want to answer. But wanting to answer is not enough. We still must actually answer. We still have to actually pick up the phone. There really are those of us who miss our calling. We're too busy, we're too preoccupied, we're too lazy to hear and respond to the call of God, and we miss it. A few years ago, for example, I was uh, at the office trying to get some work done. So I got my phone out, I needed to focus for a little bit, and I put it on silent. I worked for a few hours, and then a little bit later, I went and looked at my phone again, and I saw this ominous message on the screen. What did it say? Missed call. And I thought, oh no, <laughs> I missed my call. <laughs> I checked the message and I found out it was an old friend of mine who was passing through town. Uh, he had two like front row box seat tickets to the Cardinals. And his friend he was supposed to go with uh, dropped out and he needed somebody else to, to go to the game with him. But I had to call him back in like five minutes because the game started in 45. And uh, I called him back, and by the time I had reached him, you know, he was practically at the game, so I didn't get to go. I, I do not regret, like, turning my phone on silent, but I do regret missing the call. <laughs> and I really don't want you to regret missing yours. Because the phone won't keep ringing for you indefinitely. God is calling out for you desperately, hoping to reach you. He's calling you to faith. He's calling you to purpose. He's calling you to obedience. He's calling you to a sense of belonging that you've never known. He's calling you to forgive you of your sins and to give you the promise of eternal life forever. That's not a call you want to miss. But here's the truth. At some point, he's going to stop calling. Because he wants to go to the game with somebody He's not going to sit there in the stadium by himself. And if you're not going to go with him, he's going to call somebody else to go. It reminds me of a story uh, in the gospel, another story in the gospels, where, where Jesus tells a story about a, a, a father whose son is getting married. Maybe you know this story. And the father wants to throw this big, beautiful, huge banquet for his son on his wedding day. And so he sends all his servants out into the community with invitations, calling guards to invite them to the ceremony, to invite them to the reception. And they all get their invitations in. They're like, no, sorry, can't make it, can't make it, can't make it. And the messengers all come back to the guy, and they say, sorry, it's going to be one big empty banquet hall. He says, no, it is not. Here's some more invitations. This time I want you to go even further out, go to other towns, go to the street corners, go to the fields, go to the alleyways. Get the guy who's sleeping in the dumpster. We're going to pack this place out for my son. If you're not going to answer that invitation, he's really going to send it to somebody else. You've got to answer the phone. How do you do that? It's real simple. You tell God, I can hear you calling. I can hear you calling, and I want to respond. I don't really even know what that means, but I want to respond. I want to believe. I want to belong. I want to trust you. I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want to be a part of what you're doing here on earth in the church. I want to belong. I want to be a Christian. I want to be a follower. That's all you have to tell them. You can do it right there in your chair. Maybe you've never answered God's call before. Maybe you, in fact, can hear it ringing. You know that phone call that you know is happening, but you just don't want to answer because you know who's on the line? Sorry, I don't want to answer that one. You might even have God's number, like, programmed into your phone, and you look at the screen, it says, God, 777. You know he's calling you. And you don't want to answer because you know what he's going to give you to do. He's going to give you opportunity. And he's going to give you responsibility. He wants to forgive you your sins, and you might not be ready for that. You might not want that. Yeah, you do, though. You want everything that God has for you deep in your heart of hearts. You want everything that God has for you. But you do have to answer. It's not going to ring forever. you got to pick it up. Pick it up this morning. You can do it right where you're at, right there in your chair. You can come down and talk to me afterwards here in the chat line. We would be happy to pick up the phone together. You can let us know on your blue info card. I want to answer the call. Not really sure why. Or not really sure how. Write that on your info card. Put it in the offering bag. We'll give you a call, ironically, this week to figure that out. However, you don't miss that call, though. Because <laughs> then you're like, well, there's nothing we can do. 
However you choose to answer that call, make sure you don't miss it. This is one call you don't want to. This is the call. This is the call that could change your life, your eternity forever, but you got to pick it up before it stops ringing. Let's pray.